So forgive me if I crack straight on and ask your thoughts on... Um, well, let me see if I... I'll come up with a different take on Harry and Meghan. The, the use of the label white privilege um, and also uh, black commentators refusing to tell white commentators why they're wrong when they say they can't see any racism anywhere. It strikes me that if if we if the white people who don't know what they're talking about don't get a helping hand, then the madness continues. I don't think they want a helping hand, Matthew. But they, but they, 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 have, they, asked. they no, have asked. They have asked. No, they don't want the. There are. There's plenty, I tell you, there's there plenty are... of examples of Piers Morgan asking for examples of racism, yeah, and no one is giving him any. But no one's giving them it. Well, no, they were. They were giving them actually BuzzFeed and Huff Huffington Post did this fantastic thing where they took 20 examples of exactly the same things that Kate and Meghan Avocados, did. Avocados, wasn't it? Well, yeah, Kate, but also Kate likes putting her hair, uh, apparently if Meghan puts her hand on her bump, it indicates she's asking for our attention. It's, mm. you know, another manipulation. When Kate does it, it's motherliness. Mm. I mean, it was... But so, how's that racist and not just people don't like her? No, no, it, I don't... You can't not see the difference between the way they're covered no, and I, think, I see the difference, Yasmin. Then you think, but and I see you the think, difference, but I what don't is see it the about this woman? I, what is it? They don't know her, Right. They've never met no her. No one knows her. But no. I, well, what no. is it about someone who symbolises inequality, which is being a member of the royal family, that the woke, who are supposed to be social justice warriors, Listen, stand up for a woman I, I know, who no. wanted to join? Well, exactly. The I'm an anti royalist, but I've watched the way she's been treated. And in my head, it's not it's not only because she's biracial, but because she's woke, because she's modern, because she, she's a feminist. Now, I no, want to no, go back no, to... Let, to hang do, on, hang let on, me... No, don't just, be no, like no, Piers. No, because, no, because no, otherwise you'll just to, sound like all the other commentators. No, no, just I want go you on to, and on no, and on I, and on. I want to listen. Like can to, I please no, come back Yasmin, to the I'm first to part of your question, which I haven't answered? All you've done so far is go off on a tangent on everything I've asked you. I asked you, first of all, the first bit was, how are white people who don't understand... That's the one I want to answer. Well, I... I've only, I'll got, I've only got a three-hour okay, show, yes. I, I'll, I'll answer it. So crack there on, are white please. people out there who are more anti-racist than quite a lot of black people. Possibly? No, no, not possibly. It's true. So when I compare Preeti Patel and Sajid Javed yeah. with quite a lot of white people I know, yeah, they understand. Yeah, I hear you yeah? That, yeah. So it, it's really important that we actually have anti-racists of all persuasions trying to explain why certain forms are I be because what is agree, racism? But people aren't doing that, they're no. not explaining, and it's just shouting. And I find the whole thing appalling just appalling. I, just I think it's unfair to say it's the fault of black people because actually, you know, they've asked me several times in the last few weeks, um, days. I say, I'm not going to do this, this is just baiting. Because you'll just get shouted at, and yeah. that, that I can I, understand. I'm not going to do it actually because you are setting me up, and everything I say, yeah will make you shout at me, and I'm not doing that. But I can write about it, and I do. It's not oh, you're in a lot of trouble, aren't you? Oh, I am. What was I thinking? The woke witch finder generals are very much out for you. Now, you got a lot of support uh, from the Question Time audience uh, when you talked about uh, how you know, we're a nice country, we're not racist. We've been talking about the royals all morning, as we do every day at the moment. Yeah. Um, why do you think uh, people, some people are claiming that, that Meghan is the victim of racism in this country and that we're just a nasty, horrible country and the media's nasty and racist and she couldn't possibly stay here and has been driven away? I think it's, a, um, it's, it's how they fulfil their argument, isn't it? You can't be a wokist without blaming everybody for being racist and you have to be very intersectional and, and victim-y. So... And you have to think that the world's a bad place. Yeah, and it's just not hopeful. What world do you want to live in? A world where everyone's racist, or do you want to work live in a world where we're trying to come together? Do you think this country is racist? I think there's racism everywhere, but I don't think we're a systemically racist country. I don't see a lot of racism, but then again, I am a straight white male. And this came up again. You were uh, you actually accused a, a woman of colour of being uh, racist herself because she talked about your white privilege. And again, this has been again thought the intersectionality and this sort of diversity issue and, and identity issues about you, you're, you're a white male you're, I mean you're privileged you're, you're from a posh family you, you know you, you're in a career where you've got lots of links you're not allowed to speak about anything are you I mean straight white middle class well posh privilege. I mean I don't think you're allowed to have an opinion on anything are you I'm at the bottom of the intersectional ladder that's for sure <laughs> but um yeah I think it's I, I she was being racist at the end of the day, she I didn't raise colour at all or, or anything. And she went, you're a straight white male. And technically, that's racist. If I'd said 
if I described her in in her, you know, in you can't say that version. you're black. Yes. So and I I just got a, I was really surprised that it created such a drama, but I think it created such a drama because actually the British are very patient. And um, I think we're tired of being told that we're racist by the people that we pay money for and support and, uh, and generally applaud. So it just hurts that little bit extra when you're called a racist on top of it. And we had that, of course, over the whole Brexit debate. Mm. So we, we've had that over a lot of issues lately. Uh, do, you, do you think this is the start of the fight back? There's a lot of talk about since you know Brexit being delivered, trying to move on from those divisions, uh, about you know, Boris Johnson's uh, victory over Jeremy Corbyn. Now, there'd be lots of reasons why that happened, mm. but part of it surely must be um, a, a fight back against sort of obsession with identity politics, obsession with those sort of things. It's so dangerous, identity politics. There's nothing good about it. It's, you know, even Shami uh, Chakrabarti saying to me, you know, shouldn't it not be a woman? Is, isn't that very disparaging to women to say, well, we must put a woman ahead because she's not as good as a man in some way, so let's, you know, G her up. It's, that's extremely patronising well, to women. Jess Phillips in an interview on Sky News oh, yesterday. Oh, my goodness, like, oof. She, <laughs> she was asked, you know, they, you know Labour's never had a, le a, a leader who's a woman. All the other political parties have somehow managed it without a all-women all shortlist. But she was asked whether or not a man should stand aside. She said sometimes if you really believe in it, then a man should, you know, hand the mic over effectively. I think, you, it's a, I think it's a great idea if you've got two people that are just there and they're the same level of quality candidate and the support is 50-50, I think why not um, give the woman a chance ahead of the man because she tends to get a less of a chance in this world. But let's not assume that, that we live in a world where women are discriminated against, you everybody is discriminated against by everybody. What sort of society do we want to live in? I want to live in one where we come together, not one that divides us. Or just, and it's old-fashioned idea, meritocracy. Why not? You know, it's always good. <laughs> Otherwise you get some, you, you wouldn't want to be on a, a plane by, with a pilot saying, you know, I got this job for diversity reasons, would you? Yes, rather than... Yeah. I mean, for me, the whole... I mean, raised in a very sort of liberal family, the, 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 what, what would count as... You know, sort of values I was raised with, which was that you don't judge people uh, by their, their skin colour, their sexuality, uh, uh, their gender. You, you judge people on merit. And Martin Luther King, Luther King, you know, mm. the character... You he's, know. He's, some, from some of the Twitter feed, I try and avoid it, but a lot of people say he, we've moved on from Martin Luther King. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, good plan. Yeah. Nice <laughs> yeah. try. Let's move on from Martin Luther yeah, King. He, he has some quite sensible things to say. Yeah. But but when you say things like I don't see colour now and I don't judge people on that and you and it's irrelevant, um that that is now sort of a position that people people accuse you of being a fascist, not you, yeah. but people accuse accused of being fascist uh, and, and you know pretending they're colour blind and that in itself is a form of racism yeah. and white privilege. As opposed to what certainly in my upbringing, was, was what was called a, a liberal, modern value. Well, we have to remember that what they're accusing you of is what they are, and that's why I stand up against them, because they are everything they accuse you of. You think the people who are going around shouting racist at everybody... The, the, wo it? the wokists, I think, are fundamentally a racist Why bunch, do you yeah. think they are? Because they are racist. They see colour everywhere. They see colour everywhere. It's the everywhere. only thing they see. Yeah, and identity politics is extremely racist as well. Eventually, it also does it does atomise society, isn't it? So much yeah. about society, you know, the melting pot, this idea was that we'd all just, you know, you just judge people on their merits as opposed to everybody coming from their little corner so i'm a white middle class straight yeah. woman uh, you you know someone else might be a black lesbian uh, man mm. as opposed to just being the per being individual personalities i think it's about silencing silencing opinion i mean i've certainly noticed it with me because i wasn't expecting it to kick off but yeah. it's like you're not allowed an opinion mate you're white and it's like, oh, sorry, I've got one and I'm going to keep shoveling it down your neck. Sorry. Now, you, you've been, what some would say, a mischief maker for many years, mm. ever since uh, being expelled from, being from, un, from school and the like. Um, but you were criticised by none other than, I mean, of course, it was only a matter of time, the singer Lily Allen. That hurt. Uh, that, I bet that really hurt. Uh, she, she uh, what a surprise, expressed her view on, on Twitter, saying she was sick to, sick to death of lovies like a Lawrence Fox <laughs> going on TV and forcing their opinions on everybody else when they'll never have to deal with what normal people have to deal with in his gated community. Stick to acting, mate, instead of ranting about things you don't know anything about. I mean, pot, meat, kettle, kettle, meat, pot. It, I love the fact that you can go... I mean, she's had a pretty privileged, oh dear, upbringing, but no, she speaks for the, for the common man, doesn't she? And my gated community, we need to get some gates for it. <laughs> because, um, yeah, I've... Uh, it's not baited. You've also talked about uh, how you actually broke up with a girlfriend for being mm. too woke and you now have some rules about dating. Tell us about those. I don't think that... Um, 
anybody, man or woman, is a great going to be a great partner if they see themselves as the victim in a relationship before it's even started, and that they're the victim of some tyrannical patriarchal oppression. I think it's like, okay, bore off. I mean, I just have no interest in it. You need to be with somebody who's lived a real life, suffered hard, and stood back on their feet again. That's what uh, excites me in someone, not and someone is, going, it's awful. And is that, and is that one of the things? I mean, the victimhood. We, we, we've now got a situation where women are automatically victims. Um, uh, the, the ethnic minorities victims, uh, anyone uh, anyone who is not, again, a straight white male but is a victim. Unless uh, you're in an Asian, uni uh, unless you're in an American university and you're Asian, and then you really are actually a victim. Yeah, you know it's, what I mean? it's, it's quite it's quite bizarre, isn't it? We seem to talk about these issues far, far more than certainly we did when I was a child. But is that because, it, I mean, some people might argue that's a good thing, that people are discussing these things. Would you think it's a good thing? Does it look like it's a good thing? Is it, it doesn't. Working out? It, it's it's not doing anything but dividing us. I that I see. I think we've got to think. We've got to judge someone on the uh, the content of their character, not the colour of their skin. Doesn't help anybody. Do you find your your judge on that? Other than I mean, obviously you're All part of an time. acting dynasty. You've got you know very you know famous it's fair famous enough, parents, though. famous uh, siblings. It's fair enough. I've been taking it in the neck for being a posh boy actor who's only got a gig for, because my dad's an actor since the beginning of my career, and I'm like, fair enough. You can have a pop still, at me. I still pay my bills. I still pay my bills and my tax bill. You know, it's like, I don't mind someone taking a pop at me. In actual fact, as someone who likes freedom of speech, continue to take a pop at me. I just lose interest when I get someone says, I want to unload both barrels of a shotgun into your face. Yes, that perhaps might be going a little bit too far. <laughs> do you, do you think that, I mean, again, from the reaction you had on Question Time, and I know you sort of like 100,000 extra Twitter followers, mm. and like, you've had a lot, I mean, some of those, just to warn you, they're going to be people who are just following you just to really? take offence at everything you say. I know, this is going to shock you on really? Um, but, um, but an awful lot of people are also speaking out. When I tweeted out you were going to be on my show, just wave of joy from people saying, yes, thank God. So you tell them, you know, a lot, a lot of ladies expressing a lot of interest, by the way. Um, all, they say they're over 30 and they're not woke and they're willing to... They're, I'll, I'll hand out numbers. Um, but, uh, <laughs> my girlfriend but, will be furious. Oh, she will. No, okay, in that case, I <laughs> won't hand out numbers. Uh, but, um, but an awful lot of people just say... Someone saying what we're all thinking, and this is the thing we had that you know with I think with Boris Johnson to a certain extent and Nigel Farage and uh, and and some of the other people who've been speaking out in the last uh, few months. I think it's got a bit more braver. Douglas Murray and people like that, and saying things that everyone's saying. Thank God you're saying what what we're all thinking. I do think that this whole woke snowflake thing, it's it's a generational thing. Much very much younger mm. people under thirty, under twenty five, but also it's a minority sport. It's a minority sport, but also it, what's so wonderful is we live in this amazingly tolerant society, the most tolerant progressive society out there. All, the of, the, all of the evidence points and, to this. And, you yeah. know, then you suddenly go, well, we've got to have something to get upset about so they get upset about their oppression. And also, I think often it's a middle-class thing. It's about going, you know, I need to feel like I'm oppressed as well and let's just... We do what we have often do in this country, which is, you know, lay all our troubles on the working man and I think the working man's tired of it. And has risen up and spoken out. Not that I am the working no, man, no, but I have said, a job and I pay my bills. He said quickly. Um, what would your message be to those people who were angry and upset at what you had to say on Question Time? And again, I thought a lot of the things you said on Question Time were things that certainly, you know, my feminist mother would agree with on the women's front uh, and certainly the, the liberal values I was brought up with in terms of issues of ethnicity and colour and the like. Um, and now those considered to be far-right, dangerous, terribly unwoke views... The people who were upset by that, who were angry at you, who, who were telling you, you know, you're an affront to womanhood and ethnic minorities yeah. and blah, 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 and you, you don't understand how the world's really like, what would you like to say to them? They're listening to you right now. Trust me, they're listening to this right now. What would you like to say to them? I would like to say that I'm a human being. I'm entitled to an opinion and I'm entitled to express it. And I will respect yours if it's expressed back to me without hatred and venom and you want to have a conversation with me I'm more than happy to have a conversation with you about anything that's how we get on in life even the snowflakes well the snowflakes will just say you're a white patriarchal oppressive tyrannical male and I can't deal with you because you're so awful and I'll just go okay have a nice day <laughs> okay well uh, despite the patriarchy it's been despite an, the patriarchy. it's been a pleasure getting to meet you, you and uh, meeting you in the studio Lawrence Fox actor musician and uh, the latest uh, the latest hate figure the one who's but nevertheless someone I think most of us would agree is just speaking an awful lot of just common sense since when did common sense become so uncommon and unfashionable that's a fascist thing to say and you should be very careful common I'm, sense is a is a social construct I'm a, I'm ashamed of myself when did criticism become 
overcome racism? And do we now live in a country where you can't critique someone of a different race or gender or sexual persuasion without being accused of being racist or sexist or homophobic? To me, one of the most disturbing narratives to emerge this week over the coverage of Harry and Meghan's exit from the United Kingdom is an acceptance among the left-wing haters in this country and the US media that Britain is somehow racist. Well, I take strong issue with that. We are one of the least racist countries in the world and we welcomed Meghan to our royal family so positively. We heralded her as a future change agent in the royal family. It's just such a shame that she ended up hating the UK within 18 months and has decided to pack her bags. What do you think? 03444991000 has the coverage of Meghan Markle when she was a, 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 a mere commoner or now the Duchess of Sussex been racist? 03444991000. You can text me at 7222 or tweet at Talk Radio. But I'm joined now by an activist and author who has always been consistent in her view that the coverage of Meghan has been racist. Natasha Devon, it's brilliant to have you on the show. Why do you think, Natasha, actually, let, let me ask you more personally first. Yeah. I've written a lot about Meghan over the past two years. I've broken lots of big stories about Meghan. I first broke the row between her and Kate Middleton, for example. I broke the fact that the Queen had banned her from wearing the tiaras that were once worn by Princess Diana. And then just last week, I was the journalist to break the story of the fact that she was planning to leave the royal family with Prince Harry. I've also written a lot of commentary, which has been critical of Meghan and Harry in the decisions that they have made. Natasha, are you trying to say that my coverage of Meghan has been in any way racist? Well, I think anybody who has commented on the royal family has to be really honest and look at whether they have applied different standards to Meghan than they have to Catherine. And what has been shown in that BuzzFeed article today that is doing the rounds, we've seen almost identical headlines when Catherine and Meghan have engaged in similar behaviour. And yet, when it's Meghan, it's been spun to be a negative thing. When it's Kate, it's a positive thing. But Natasha, you and can cherry pick anything. It is totally unfair to do this cherry picking because you're taking things out of context. Can I make one point about Kate specifically? Kate for all of her brilliant points, right, is a pretty dull woman. She plays by the rules. She's a future queen. She's a queen in waiting. That's always what she has been. Now, back in the early days of her time dating Prince William, she was criticised in the media. She was given nicknames like Weighty Katie. But lately, she hasn't really done anything to upset the apple cart. I put to you, Natasha, that the reason the coverage of Kate is so different to Meghan is that Meghan came into this family wanting to change things, wanting to shake things up, and she has waded into politics in, in ways where it's not appropriate. Well, then I think that's we not racism. Why, why we want Megan to be dull? As, as far as I'm concerned, Megan represents a lot of the things that are important to women her age, to millennials. Um, she has an interest in feminism, in the environment, in racism. None of those things should be things that, as a British society, we are afraid of. And she gave up a very lucrative career in the States because she fell in love with one of our princes. She tried to ingratiate herself into the royal family, but she found that the media in particular was so hostile that she was unable to do that. And so she's now... Natasha, have, have you studied the history? Have you studied the history? When Princess Diana went and launched a landmine campaign in Africa just months before her deaths. She was roundly criticised in the media because she was wading in a, into a political issue at the time. She was devastated about it. She is a white woman. Why bring race into it? Well, I, I think that a lot of the negative press of Princess Diana did have towards the end of her life has to do with the fact that she was apparently in a relationship with a man of colour. So I do oh. think that race played a part in that oh. as well. God. However, You're I, looking for racism everywhere, aren't you, Natasha? You're just desperately think, trying to find it. I think that misogyny played a part in both of the, the treatment of these women. But there is such a thing as misogynoir, which is misogyny, misogyny 
specifically directed towards black women and it's a specific type of misogyny. And I think if you've got two women with a, a similar roles in society behaving in similar ways and our gut reaction is different to those women when in reality the, the only difference between them is the color of their skin we have to ask ourselves some serious questions about why we have that inherent bias but Natasha we don't have that bias you're talking rubbish unfortunately what about all of the columns that I have written over the past few years absolutely slamming Prince Andrew, Prince Charles, Prince William and Prince Harry, all for different indiscretions that they have made, including, by the way, uh, Prince Charles wading into political issues. I think it, what you're doing is what quite often tends to happen when you're trying to have this discussion with white people. They will take it personally and think that you're accusing them personally of racism and become very defensive. And I think we... Well, Natasha, so I'm, I'm one of the people who works for a national newspaper who has probably written more about Meghan and Harry than any other journalist. So hmm. it's, it's quite hard really for me to believe that you're not personally accusing me. Well, I think the cumulative impact of all of the headlines that we have seen have shown a very distinct bias against Meghan. And I, I, I think, Natasha, you're not a student of history because I, I, I challenge you to go back to the 80s and look at the way that Sarah Ferguson and Princess Diana were greeted in the media and to the royal family. And I'm not saying it's good, but what I'm saying is that any time there is a newcomer to the royal family, they face a big pushback from the institution. The institution leaks a lot to the media and that's where these headlines come from. What I don't understand is you're trying to say that it's about race. Well, I, I, both of those stories ended badly, obviously one more tragically than the other. I think we have to... Of course, it's terrible, mind. but it's not about race, is it? That Harry is seeing th history repeat itself. But do you know why I think it's about race? Yeah, it's go on. Because it's because black women, brilliant campaigners like Afua Hirsch, up and down the country have said, this is the type of treatment that I have endured my entire life. Racism doesn't always have an obvious face. Often it's about microaggression. And black women have recognized it as the type of racism that they face. And they are the experts on racism because they are the people who are having to live it every single day. And that's why I think it has something to do with race. But do you not concede that Meghan was welcomed with open arms by this country, by the media in this country, when she joined the royal family? No, I, mean, I don't. I genuinely, Natasha, I genuinely don't remember a day in the past decade that has been more happy than that day I spent in London hosting a party, being out on the streets on the day that Meghan entered into the royal family. Everyone absolutely adored the way that she brought uh, her culture into the ceremony. We wrote editorials at The Sun about the fact that finally here was a woman who could freshen up and drag the royal family into the 21st century. I mean, I just feel like the coverage of her joining the royal family was the total opposite of racism. So if you were so excited about her freshening up and, and ushering in a new era to the royal family, why, when the nuts and bolts of that had to be sorted out, why, when she started to introduce real change, real structural change, did you suddenly turn on her? Because it's totally inappropriate for members of the royal family to wade into politics or to set up commercial deals. That's nothing to do with modernisation. It's nothing to do with race. So are you, as, for example, critical of William and Kate's commercial endeavours or the fact that they're... Well, they don't have um, commercial endeavours. They, well, they, they have a company. But, and, but, and but, but, but by the way, the by the way, I mean, yes, when William was not doing much work, can I say, for the royal family, it was The Sun, where I'm executive editor, that coined the term work shy will. And that was incredibly damaging to him, so damaging, in fact, that it made him realise, my goodness, I've got to start taking my responsibilities seriously. And by the way, my criticism of the Sussexes has aimed as much at Prince Harry as it is Meghan. Yeah, I think maybe where we're talking at cross-purposes is I'm not trying to suggest that the treatment of Meghan is just about race. What I'm saying is that her race is a factor. OK, that can you give me some things. specific examples of racist coverage of Meghan that has appeared well, in that, the press? That's with the misunderstanding of what racism looks like. You don't have to overtly reference someone's race in order to be racist. What, you, what racism what? looks like is... So you can't give me one example? 
what racism is, what structural racism is, is having two people who behave in the same way but are treated differently because but of... Kate the and of Megan haven't behaved in the same way. They're totally when, when different. I would, I would say that Megan and Princess Diana have behaved in a similar way and Princess Diana received so much negative coverage but just like Megan, she also received a lot of adoration and people adored her. People like me absolutely adored her. So okay, I, but, okay, I think... I, I think comparing Kate and Meghan is comparing chalk and cheese. And I think okay, Meghan think, can be compared to Princess Diana, a revolutionary woman who wants to come in and change the royal family. And to say that Princess Diana got all good treatment by uh, is just ridiculous. No, I'm, I'm not saying that. Again, it's, ta it's taking it to the extreme. I wonder what coverage Princess... I wonder if Princess Diana would even have been in the royal family if she was a woman of colour. But we're, we're digressing. So uh, you asked for an example. Both Kate and Meghan have a penchant for avocados. The headline for Meghan was, um, for Kate was, isn't it sweet that Prince William is sourcing avocados to her, which helped with her morning sickness? The headline for Meghan was that her favourite snack is funding slavery and deforestation throughout the world. Now, can you see the difference between those two treatments for identical well, of behavior? course I do. Of course I do. But you've cherry-picked two headlines from... A, 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 from a media organisation that runs literally tens of thousands of headlines a week. What I'm actually wanting you to provide me is an example of racist coverage of Meghan, and I don't think you can do it. I don't think well, you okay. can do it. Well, OK, I have it. I have a challenge for you, Dan, because you've challenged me to brush up on my history, and that's a challenge that I accept. I would like you to brush up on structural racism because I don't think you really understand what it is and what it looks like. And, no, I'm just disputing you know, with you that it's been relevant in the case of Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex. I think that her outcomes overall have been worse. The way she has been treated has been worse than if she was a white woman. I totally disagree. You're free to disagree, but that, that is based on listening to black women and their experiences and also knowing something about structural racism. That's why I believe but what you're but, but then what you're saying, and, and this is where, Natasha, I really think you've got to think long and hard about what you're saying. What you're saying is that anyone who is not BAME cannot criticise Meghan without being structurally racist. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm, I'm well, saying that is that's what you're saying, because I'm telling you, hand on heart, my coverage of Meghan, any negative coverage of Meghan, has been based on things which I feel she deserves to be criticised on. Just like I make those same decisions on a daily basis about Prince Charles, about Prince Harry, about Prince William, and, and I can point to hundreds of examples where I've treated members of the royal family in a tough way in my columns or in my okay, reporting. So, so and it's nothing to do race. with race. But yet you're saying that the coverage of Megan is structurally racist. So your radio show today is, what, three hours long? Yes. And you're dedicating an hour of it to talking about Meghan. How much and airtime Harry. Have you, and Harry. And Harry. How much airtime have you dedicated to Prince Andrew and the scandal surrounding Oh, him? my goodness. Well, if you've been listening regularly, you will know that we've done item after item on it. So we've okay. just devoted a huge amount of time to it. And if you well, look at the it? amount of time that the British media has devoted to coverage of Sarah Ferguson's indiscretions over the years, uh, Princess Diana's indiscretions over the years, Sophie Wessex's indiscretions over the years, I mean, it's totally bonkers if you're trying to say here that members of the royal family haven't previously had acres of coverage for doing things wrong. And by the way, Prince Andrew was one of the most, if not the most, written about story in the British media last year. I'm not sure that I've seen the degree of scrutiny for tiny little actions in the way that I have with Meghan, from the choice of flowers that she had at her wedding, for choosing to wear an off-the-shoulder gown, for asking somebody not to take a picture of her at a tennis match. Like We don't see the same level of scrutiny for other royals. They have to do something huge that's an indiscretion before it comes to the media attention. And that's racist. Yeah. Do you think our country's racist, Natasha? Is the UK a racist country? As many coming columnists as, have claimed. This coming week. as I do from a mixed race family and being by far the lightest out of all of my siblings and seeing how different people's reactions are to me than to my darker brothers and sisters, yes, we are. St we still have a long way to go when it comes to race in this co in this country. So the UK is a racist country. 
it's I'm not saying everybody in the UK is a racist. I'm saying well, that structurally there is more work to do in order to to combat racism. But there's always more work to do on lots of areas. I mean, I just feel so offended that you know I, that that you would sort of lump the British press, lump British society, like so many left wing columnists have done this week, into a category that says we're racist. And by the way, to these American columnists at the New York Times and the Washington Post who have the cheek to call the UK a racist society when they come from the US, one of the most racist countries in the world, makes me sick. Well, I would encourage you to look at the work of Dr. Keon West at Goldsmith University. He has authored numerous papers where they have measured very precisely structural racism and shown that a person in the UK who is born white can have exactly the same opportunities, circumstances, behaviours as a person of colour, and the person of colour will have less good outcomes than the white person. Of course. Racism of is course, something that you can course, measure. But, but, this, but, but Megan, who you are pointing as the example to this, is one of the most privileged women in this country. OK, you could argue that, but still she's been bullied and harassed to the extent that she felt that she has to move somewhere else. That's how welcoming the... Or she's, or she's decided to move somewhere else, Natasha, because she wants to make millions and millions of pounds. She doesn't want to have to go and open community centres in Nottingham. She wants to hang out in $14 million mansions with friends like Oprah Winfrey. That's why she's moved. Well, we I put it to speculate. you. I, we can speculate about her motivations, but from what I've seen during her... her and am I racist she, for doing that? No, we're having a discussion. I'm very glad we're having the discussion. But I think when you look at what she was doing when she was working as a full-time royal, you know, going to kit the kitchens at Grenfell and raising money for women's she charities... She got glowing coverage. That's yeah, what happened, and, and Natasha. To me, that does, That's that what does happened. She got glowing coverage when she was in Africa. When she was working and doing good work and launching charity cookbooks and going to Africa and raising causes, uh, raising uh, the uh, profile of important charity causes, she got glowing coverage. I'll tell you when she didn't get glowing coverage, Natasha, and likewise Prince Harry, because they both got the negative coverage, it was when they started to preach to the British society about climate change, and then it was revealed they took four private jet flights in 11 days. That was nothing to do with racism, Natasha. It was to do with point blank, blatant hypocrisy. And I'm glad they were called out on it. I think it's despicable that people like you try and say that it's to do with structural racism. Didn't the, both the duchesses and the dukes, William and Harry, Kate and Meghan, talk about the environment? How many private jets did William and Kate take during that time? Well, over that time, they were on little... They were on, um, flying on little budget budget flights and we did absolutely report on that and that Prince Andrew was equally criticised for jetting off on a private jet as well but he was not preaching to us about the need for climate change so again it's I, yeah, I, I think it's really interesting that you use the term preaching because I think if I was the subject of that intense amount of media scrutiny and I really had no control over that as a member of the royal family your every move is monitored to turn that spotlight onto worthy causes like mental health like the environment like HIV I think was a really admirable thing for this new generation yes, no, one's, and no one's criticizing for what they that, do. no one's criticizing them with what they've done um, for mental health for example or what they've done for the Invictus Games or what they've done for the uh, survivors of the Grenfell Tower uh, inferno but I'm sorry do you, are you honestly telling me that it was it at all racist or at all unfair to point out that Meghan and Harry were telling the world about the need to cut down carbon emissions while taking four private jet flights in 11 days, which all environmental campaigners say is the worst thing you can do to increase your carbon footprint. If you think the like media shouldn't have pointed out that hypocrisy, then you don't understand what we're here to do. That is what we're here to do. That's what the media is here to do, to call out wrongdoing, to call out hypocrisy and to keep keep public figures honest. And we've done it with Prince Charles over the years, we've done it with Prince Andrew over the years, and yes, we have done it recently with Prince Harry and Meghan. Well, I, I dispute that you've done it with Prince Andrew over the years. We're only just now revisiting historic wrongdoings. Uh, his, well, excuse me, excuse me. It was actually News of the World in 2011 that was the first to print pictures after a very long investigation proving that he was friends with uh, with uh, Jeffrey Epstein again walking through Central Park. So, in fact, if it wasn't for the media, Natasha, uh, no one would have had any idea that Prince Andrew was, fr was friends with Jeffrey Epstein. It was the media spending a lot of money on investigations that actually uncovered that. 
So I think, again, you're totally cherry-picking arguments that you want to make and they're not anchored in facts because the media has long kept the royals honest. Prince Charles... Prince William. It was uh, the media that exposed Sophie Wes Wessex's dodgy dealings when she was working as a PR executive. You, you know, it, it's just totally wrong to say to say that 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 you know. But I'll give you the final word. Well, I, I wouldn't want anybody to leave this conversation thinking that I think that the media is one homogenous blob. We are talking about very specific corners of the media that are obsessed with the royals and have treated Meghan differently than they have other women in the royal family, particularly other women in the royal family in 2019 and 2020. And I personally believe women of colour when they say this is symptomatic of the type of subtle micro-racism that I have to deal with every single day of my life. But first, and I'm afraid it does involve Harry and Meghan, so if you're a, <laughs> of a Republican, you're just, well, kind of. It's really about racism, I suppose. Right. Okay. And, I mean, there have been so many sh people shouting for the different sides, so much intransigence, uh, you know, you're a racist for saying anything negative about Meghan. No, I'm not, she's greedy. But what I thought... It, it sort of boiled down to, just today, was a really interesting note, that, again, that came from Kevin, that we have Rebecca Long-Bailey, uh, the Labour leadership contender, uh, pretty much to the left uh, compared to the other contenders. There's a left-winger, die-hard socialist. She is of the view that Meghan is the victim of racist, racism. And then you've got two Tories, James Cleverly and Pretty Patel, both people of colour, who say she absolutely is not the victim of racism. And I thought it's really interesting of whether we can extrapolate from that whether our thoughts on racism or what constitutes racism are informed and actually skewed by our overwhelming, overarching political thoughts. <laughs> Left wing, you see racism. Centre right, you don't. Uh, and for guidance here, I thought we'd turn to uh, Professor Frank Ferredi as a sociologist and see what he has to say. And he joins us on the line now. Afternoon, Professor Frank. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It's, I mean, I know I'm massively oversimplifying, and I know at the heart of all of this is what we, what racism, what the definition of racism is. But do you think uh, that it, is, it could as, it simply be a, a reflection? What what we see as racism, uh, the kind of racism we see, is informed by our overarching political thoughts. I think it does. I think there are two working definitions of racism. Now, I think there is a definition two. of of Rebecca Long Bailey, who kind of thinks that uh, race, racism is normal, um, it's part of everyday life, she think, and she kind of goes along with the idea that human relations are always potentially um, uh, susceptible to racial conflict. And you know, she will probably believe that even if you don't think you're racist, if you're a white person, you might still be racist because you might have unwitting ideas about other kinds of people. So. From her point of view, you know, in any relation between two different uh, groups of people, racism is always uh, always there right. and you know, lurking in the background. And I think that that's why you'll find that her kind of politics, uh, uh, which is essentially uh, dominated by this idea of identity, identity, uh, politics, identity politics, yeah, yeah, is so readily uh, drawn towards drawing the conclusion that it's got to be racist. Whereas you have the other point of view which is the classical definition of race, racism, which is based on the idea that racism is about discriminating against other people, not treating them equally. Uh, it's not about uh, your inner thoughts. It's not about the fact that just because you're white, you automatically have these privileges which uh, somehow warrant you to look down upon other people. But it's got to do with the physical act of discriminating. And it's got to do with the fact that these acts of discrimination are backed up by, by, by publicly expressed prejudices. So I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking the truth is probably somewhere between the two points of view, isn't it? That uh, when I was hearing uh, the naysayers saying that Meghan is not the victim uh, of racism, and they always say, give me the examples, show me the examples of, of the racist abuse that has been piled upon her. And it, while it is true that one can find uh, plenty of tweets, racist tweets and such like, overt racist 
uh, claims uh, and statements in, in newspapers, I think, are few and far between. But a mindset, uh, you know, just as we could call out the police for institutional racism, the idea that newspapers in which I worked, which were predominantly white, uh, and, and when I was there, predominantly male as well, it does seem entirely possible that there could be a, uh, a sort of pervasive sense of racism within the institutions of media. Uh, and conversely, those that see no racism at all maybe just choose to be blind to those those. That, that sort of pervasive sense of racism, institutional racism. Yeah, I mean, that, that, is, that is a possibility. But I think we have to uh, be extremely wary of the, about the idea that somehow, you know, you, you, know, you are a racist or you're thinking racist thoughts, even though you don't actually feel that you are. Because under those circumstances, it's almost as if somebody else gets to decide what you're thinking and oh, what yes. you're about. And I think there's a lot of dangers with that. I think uh, what I'm worried about is that we now seem to have an expansive view of race. Just to give you an example, there's a lot of discussion on racism in football. Yeah. And there is racism in football, without a doubt. No but doubt. I, I've been going to football matches now since the late 1970s. And I can tell you, in the late 1970s, you know, racism was in the air. You could almost cut it yeah. with a knife. I go to football now, and I go every second week to my home game. You know, uh, I go to other matches, and it's conspicuous by its absence. You know, I'm not, it doesn't mean to say there aren't racist fans in there, but you know, when you look around and you compare it to what it was, it, 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 it's, it's incomparable. And yet, if you were to read many newspaper articles, they give the impression that racism has never been such a big problem in football as it is now, and, and, and that it's growing and growing all the time. So I think that... That kind of expansive view of the problem has got to do with a, the redefinition of what racism is, and it's something that we're almost looking for, uh, hoping to discover, you know, rather than having the is kind it, of real, tangible existence. You see, I, 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 I share your views uh, about how racism has changed, but I, I, I'd... I'd sort of uh, put it down to the, the, the sort of sense, the sense that we get today from the newspapers and put it down to the fact that we're now painfully aware of racism when we hear it because when you, from the, the bad old days when you'd hear all manner of horrible racist chants, now they're few and far between. So when you do hear one, it hits home hard. It, it does hit hard, but I think that uh, what we also have, and I, I know this as a university mm. professor, is, is a culture where uh, young people are encouraged to think that by and large, you know, racial conflict and racial tensions are very normal. And that, uh, and that uh, therefore, uh, you, you've got to check your privilege and, and make sure that you're you kind of checked and rechecked it. Uh, and if you haven't, then, you know, you, you, know, you may well be, have done a, a, a racial crime. And I, I think there's a kind of, you know, basically what we've done is we're doing at the moment is we're trivializing real acts of racism. You know, real, real racial prejudice by equating that with what I would call an act of miscommunication or uh, just a misunderstanding. I mean, everything can be kind of interpreted in a, in a racial you. frame. I hear you. It's, it, it's uh, I mean, just in terms of, say, uh, say Lawrence Fox uh, putting his head above the parapet talking about Meghan, and uh, he is immediately, you know, loads of people say, white privilege, white privilege, white privilege. And, and he says, well, yes, but what can I do about it? I, I can't change my characteristics, you know. I am white and I am privileged. And to, to use it as a stick to beat me with is in itself a sort of form of racism, he would argue. That's right, because that, what, what, what he's really saying is that being white has become like, the equivalent of original sin. The bit that gets me, Frank, is I can remember going to um, police calls, we used to call them on local papers in, in the mid-1980s, and the police were not necessarily particularly uh, au fait with uh, modern politically correct uh, language, and they would infer that, you know, black, uh, any crime going on, oh, that would be black people doing that. And you, you say, you just can't do that, you know, you can't smear an entire group of people just because of the actions of some, and yet that now seems to be exactly what we've done with white, that all white people are white and privileged, especially if they're male. And I'm not sure, I was just saying to Helen, that if I was to take you down and introduce a, uh, one of my friends who was uh, raped by his own father, ended up in a children's home and got on heroin while he was in a children's home and is still on heroin on the streets today, I'm not sure his experience of white privilege uh, would be uh, very much similar to, to Lawrence Fox's. Probably not, and I think what's very sad is that we're racializing everything. So uh, yes. uh, you know, the sin that was committed by racists in the past is now kind of compounded by the fact that we have just kind of 
quietly accepted that everything is racial and, and just gone along with that kind of narrative. Where does it end, Frank? Where, 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 what's the end game here? I, I think that there are a lot of sensible people who, who deep inside can tell the difference between racism and, and, and kind of the performance of, ra- of outrage about racism. Yeah. They, know, they, they can tell there's a difference there. I think the trouble is that a lot of public figures have become so wedded to the politicization of identity that they feel that if they speak out or they object, they're going to get the same reaction that Fox did. So I think it, it's a question. If, if people can be a little bit braver and tell the truth and, and be open to discussing and debating these things, I do think we can somehow challenge this culture because it doesn't help anybody. None of the none of the groups you know, implicated in this, none of the ethnic or racial groups implicated in this are going to benefit from this very uh, totally. dour, you know, sort of pessimistic view of, of what a human being is like. I, I love talking to you, uh, Frank Ferradi, and really appreciate you, you giving up your time because you've held uh, the three of us, uh, we're absolutely enthralled, hanging on your every word. <laughs> Professor Frank Ferradi, thanks a bundle.